Bon dia a tots i a totes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mubeli, one of the memory venues of the city, which will develop even further in coming years, and it will be even more than it is now. We're here today to introduce these international sessions entitled Shelter Citizens, Memory and Subsoil in Europe, and we do so in Barcelona. And this is one of the first conferences, an international conference, in which we make a comparison of shelters from Barcelona and shelters from other European capital cities. Here with me at the table, I have the people who have promoted and organized this conference and other devices that we will tell you about now, because today we are starting up um, a piece, a device to commemorate Barcelona shelters in, and compare them with others in the world. We will start now with this international conference. We will continue with an exhibit, and then we will continue with two books. But now I'll pass the floor over first to Jordi Guichet, director of the European Observatory on Memories of the Solidarity Foundation of the University of Barcelona, and afterwards the curators of the exhibition, Charlie Domenac and Ana Sanchez. So, Jordi, you have the floor. Gracias, Jordi. Thank you, Jordi. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Xavier, Jordi, Anna, dear colleagues and attendees and the collaborators who will participate in the different panels and tables coming from different places in Europe. Good morning. First of all, because I always forget it at the end, otherwise, I would like to say a few words of appreciation. Uh, the Observatory, the European Observatory of Memories, when Terry called me a while back, he said, we have a project, we've talked to the Town Council of Barcelona about air raid shelters, uh, and has very good um, photographic materials of, of hundreds of shelters. And I said, of course, yes, we will discuss the details, but of course, let's do it. It couldn't be any other way. And also in the framework of a collaboration agreement, which is well known by all and has been very fruitful, not only on shelters, but on other aspects and the development of uh, memory activities and the Department of Memory. So I would like to thank the Town Council of Barcelona for their task and their collaboration. Uh, Axel Domenech, the archaeology service, who has collaborated and been a part, a very active part, on the preparation of contents and the structure of part of these contents. Josep Pujadas, Xavi Maese, the commissioners of the exhibition, they will talk to you, Xavi Domenech and Ana Sanchez. Our team and the team of interpreters, Silvia Pala, who is somewhere at the back and who very nicely brought us coffee before. And our team, Andrea Milanka, Ricard Cuneza, for his great task. Fernanda at the back as well, Xavier Navat. Good morning, Ramon, sorry. And there will be oh, also the staff here who, with these uh, activity and others, uh, uh, exhibitions and the in between management of this memory space that we hope to continue to drive into the future, La Model, Teresa Angels, and Laia. I'm sure I forgot someone, but I had to do this. I had to appreciate the work of these people and not much more. Uh, well, about the conference, we have this transnational perspective from the observatory. We've been applying it for 10 years now when we talk also about the uses of the past, memory policies, and in this case, with this more artistic uh, view, a more documentalistic, and with this reflection of the underground legacy of uh, this social and civil trauma, and trauma that is very much related to the contemporary transmission through these different disciplines, through photography, archaeology, anthropology, 
even memorial uh, tourism. Mr. Contel, who from the World of Associations has been organizing guided tours to the Glacier shelters, especially the, the Amman Square, for many years now. Well, we'll talk about these and more in this couple of days, but always with this transnational perspective, this comparative perspective that helps us to better understand memorial processes and uh, turning these memorial spaces into heritage, oftentimes with jealousy. Why not say it? We always compare ourselves with the French, English, German processes, and we're jealous because here, when we started a few years ago, many years ago, and some of you in my team may remember, we visited shelters all over Catalonia with our helmets on because there were many problems when talking about victims, uh, common graves, but it seemed like the memory in shelters was more positive, nice, um, town councils of the entire political spectrum, because in Barcelona, for example, we had already uh, rehabilitated uh, Shelter 307, and well, back then we had better policies, and actually we are already using pictures from that decade, from the year 2000 to 2011, the decade of remembrance. And I don't know, maybe I'm being a bit too nostalgic, but it's true that it was one of the most important turning points, I would say, in the recovery of remnants from the war, bunkers, shelters, cemeteries, Ricardo Conesa knows about this well, and the first thing that we did was probably work on Arab shelters, and there were thousands of, of, of projects or requests of projects, not all of them became true, and we organized sessions to debate about what to do. We had dilemmas because every district, of course, wanted to rehabilitate the shelters for the civil population to be able to visit them. And we have architectural experts who will talk about them. They are very interesting spaces. They convey memory. They convey feelings and sensations in the original place, which is also important. And they are magnificent spaces for education and teaching for the youngest, which is what we always worry about. Those of us who are getting older, we worry about how to convey all of these uh, dilemmas and, and everything related to history and memory to schools and young people in contemporary societies. So without further ado, I pass it over to my colleagues and friends, and I hope their words will be interesting. They will not be their last words. It will be a starting point. And yes, we will continue to debate and talk about this over the next couple of days. And welcome all, and thank you. So. Okay, now, welcome. I was going to say thank you too. I will not take too long because Jordi said thank you to absolutely everyone. Uh, but I was going to thank the um, Department of Memory of the uh, Town Council for the work on the exhibit that will open on the 30th on Eric Shelters, the Archaeology Service, the Subsoil Unit, the Catalan Police, Mossos Squadra, who did a great job uh, so that we could access many of the shelters that are uh, difficult to access because of the lack of oxygen and material conditions they're in. So I would like to thank all the stakeholders who have participated in making these sessions possible and of course the, the group. And why why today? Why on March 16th, 2023, are we all meeting here to talk about this? Because on March 16th, 85 years ago, 
uh, a horrific telegram signed by the Italian dictator Mussolini was sent to the Mallorca Legion and said it was a telegram that announced something that had already happened. It had happened on January 30th, 1938, and the big symbol is San Filippo Square and the death of children there, which was the Atapeto bombing. And bombings in which the civil population is not a collateral victim, it is the main target of the war. And in this awful telegram by Mussolini, it, it led to the beginning of the most horrific uh, bombings of the city of Barcelona in 1938. For 41 hours straight, the city was bombed with the aim of causing the complete thorough merciless war, as Mussolini called it, to, in, in which people would know Italians not because of their capacity to smile and play mandolin, but the capacity to wreak havoc, to create terror. These were absolutely horrific bombings. It was the first time in the Spanish Civil War in which the State Department of the United States published a note, and they said this is unacceptable, this new warfare technique is absolutely unacceptable. It was the first time in which the Vatican reacted and asked Franco not to continue to act along those lines. Uh, so imagine the dimension of a phenomenon which was completely new back then and that would become absolutely usual later on. Even the ambassador of Nazi Germany sent a letter to Berlin saying maybe we're overdoing it these in Nazi Germany. So imagine the, the dimension of a new type of war, which was absolutely new at the time, and which caused an international scandal, which died down, unfortunately. And Barcelona, the city of Barcelona, in the new logic of total warfare, which started in the First World War and reached its peak in the Second World War, Barcelona was a key chapter of this development, as was the reaction of citizens, the reaction of Republican institutions and the citizens of Barcelona during this phenomenon. And this reaction basically is summarized in what was known in, in British debates as the Barcelona model, the Barcelona model of collective building of 1,322 air raids that we have now uh, in Barcelona. These were horrific days, over 44 tons of bombs, over 41 hours, and unfortunately 670 deaths due to the bombings. And let me say this between very many inverted commas. It was a low proportion as compared to the ferocity of the attack. And this is mainly due to the relative quality of the air raid shelters. And we're making a commemoration here that turns into a reflection as to why, to what end. At that time, that was a shared European experience with Barcelona at the center. Uh, on the debate of the building of shelters. The Barcelona model is present in the debate subsequently. It was a shared experience, a shared history, both in terms of bombings and shelters, did not become, become shared memory. It, not, it did not become shared memory, basically, because when most countries in Europe were waking up from the fascist nightmare, here we here the dark Franco regime night was only just starting. So we were far from any memory debate, a memory construction debate of the 30s and 40s. And now not only in order to place Barcelona in the European context, but because we understand that the treatment, the historic treatment of memorials, archaeological treatment and memorial treatment of shelters strengthens us. Placing the case of Barcelona in the European context helps us also explain how this story 
unfolded in Europe, and it also helps us understand ourselves and start a debate as to what to do with this memory. Jordi Guichet mentioned it uh, very adequately. The memory of shelters is probably, well, when we, oftentimes when we talk about the Spanish Civil War, we talk about the events of May, ideological uh, facts, but the great collective experience of the war is total warfare, the new experience of total warfare. The fact that the rear war was as much in the world as the front line. And in this collective experience of total warfare, there is a big, a colossal effort, collective effort, unheard of before, of building shelters, citizens building shelters, institutions, but also citizens building shelters. So when we talk about this, we are talking about notes, hubs of one of the most collective experiences experienced in Barcelona back in the day of resistance against fascist attacks. And I hope we will be able to talk about the reconstruction, reconstruction of this uh, memory and, and current u and future uses of this memory. <laughs> I guess it still works. Yes. Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you, especially to those of you who come from afar. As many of you, or I, I had contact with many of you over the past year, intense contact that has helped us build this exhibition that will open on March 30th here at La Model 1322. And as the members of the panel said, I wanted to remember some of the keys, some of the seeds of this project and these international sessions. A year ago, exactly a year ago, I was in London visiting shelters, and then I went to Berlin, and out of these travels, I got a very sad feeling, which was that abroad, people knew Barcelona as a a test bed of the Second World War and historians, activists, representatives of associations who manage this heritage abroad knew very clearly that Barcelona had been brutally bombed, but very little people knew about the shelters and almost no one knew what the British Parliament has had dubbed as the Barcelona model. Almost no one knows the document Barcelona Lessons, which is spectacular. It was written by a veteran commander of the First World War who was sent to Barcelona in April 1938, one month after, after the March attacks, because the British government wanted to have a first-hand report in the field about what Republican Barcelona was doing. And he drafted one of the most important documents on Catalan passive defense, which was called Barcelona Lessons Advice for Local Authorities and Individual Citizens. And that document, which was the result of an intense debate at the beginnings of the Second World War, 1938 and 39, just like the statements of Ramon Pereira explaining this Barcelona model, these air raid shelters, these community air raid shelters built in a very specific manner that helped save thousands of lives in Barcelona. As Xavi said, that did not help generate a shared memory, a shared experience. And now, 85 years later, we do not yet have this shared knowledge of, for example, what is being done in Germany, London, Barcelona. When I went to Berlin, Munich, Manchester, London, Paris, I tried to find out what they know about us and what they are doing now. And these two questions are at the very foundation of these sessions, because these sessions aim at placing Barcelona in the map of uh, European memory, shelters, but also knowing what is being done with the Second World War heritage in other places in the world. And it's surprising in London, you know, there is a private initiative of planting crops in these shelters, and there is a model to memorialize the institutional uh, life of the government, war rooms, all of the shelters of the British government. It's so very interesting. And what is being done in Berlin with contemporary art in bunkers or the Munich Music School in Hitler's shelter, 
these are initiatives, also the memorialization in Paris with the Freedom Museum placed at the command center of the French resistance. These are initiatives that we don't know well here, so we wanted to bring them closer to our territory and, and compare them to what we're doing. And I wanted to add in all of this process that we've gone through for the exhibition that will open on March 30th, we've seen how historically invisible women are in shelter memory. I'm sure you are not surprised by this, but I wanted to share it because normally military heroes go on to be remembered in history, those responsible for active uh, defense, but it's been very difficult to find female names in Barcelona linked to the shelter heritage. We know in an inconsistent manner that they were part of the labor building the shelters, but we know this in a very diffuse manner. We do not really know their their stories, they are not in the pictures, and I thought this was something that happened to us only, but that's not the case. If you travel and if you try to find memories of, of women in European shelters, they're not there. The memory of partisans, the neighbors, the brigadiers, the female brigadiers who built this heritage is not found in Europe either. The case of Paris is especially symptomatic. I don't know if you know who Cécile Roltangui was. She was a woman who wrote the cry for resistance and the liberation of Paris started with her and the shelter where she did that carries the name of her husband today and this happens in Paris it happens here as well we've tried to revert this situation it's very difficult to find the female names and it, it continues to be absolutely anonymous and I hope you will be able to debate over the couple of the next couple of days about this and thank you very much. Okay. So thank you very much for all of your words. Barcelona was a pioneer in passive defense. It was a pioneer in this civil movement, this citizen movement and institutional self protection movement. And I would say that for decades the city of Barcelona has been a pioneer in the study and knowledge of its shelters. And I wanted to mention the importance of the task of the archaeology service. For many years now, they've been cataloging, researching, digging, disseminating, advising. And we've managed to bring forward the website that we presented a few months ago, where you can find all of the documented shelters to date and where we can even read the reports in some of them. In some of them, we can even go on a 3D visit. Barcelona City of Shelters is the name of the site. There are also now three additional videos of different dimensions of the shelters. And during, 20, during 2022, 14 interventions have been made in shelters, archaeological interventions and some new ones have been discovered, such as Pique Street, Mandayo Street, the Mercadal Square where the shelters were accessed again, and shortly we will be able to announce the rehabilitation of the Sagrera Tower shelter. So there is a lot of work that doesn't end and doesn't stop by the archaeology service of documenting and cataloging all of these shelters. We have a lot of knowledge about everything that we have, but we need more. Because in these sessions, what we want to ask ourselves is also, what now? We have 1,322 shelters documented. There may be more. We will have the opportunity to access more shelters, but we know that many of them will never be open to the public due to security um, issues. And what will we do? What have they done in other European cities? In what way have they rehabilitated them? How can they be recovered for citizens. We need to map them to open websites. We need Do we need to open more shelters to uh, the public? We need to reflect and we need to do so with these international experiences. And this is why these international sessions are so important because they have to set the path 
for these objects, these heritage, these memory objects that exist and are present in our city, in our subsoil, and that we need to be able to disseminate more, and we need to see how to do that. This is what we have to ask ourselves, and we have to mainly share experiences. These are sessions in which we have archaeologists, historians, other researchers, architects, ac activists for memory. And ma many of these stories of our shelters would not have come to light without neighborhood uh, entities who have defended the protection of the heritage. And then other institutions have walked in their footsteps. And all of these entities must have a say, too, about how we want to tell the story of our neighborhoods, of our cities. These sessions aim at being a memorial heritage reflection or reflection on the cultural legacy represented by these shelters, and also a more pragmatic reflection. What, what now? What do we do with all of these spaces now? Many of them will never be open to the public. And whenever you announce that you've done rehabilitation work, and when people know that there's a new shelter that has been opened up, people want to access it. And it's difficult because of security issues, but also oftentimes because they are not finished or there have been other problems over the decades. There's a, there are clear problems when you want to approach these shelters, and oftentimes we need to give many explanations as to why they can't access them. So, and this is something that we should talk about here, too. We also have the exhibit, and there will be two more uh, books, the catalog, the book on the website, the shelter website, and we will have other objects that we will be able to hold in our hands or the website. But what will we do when we are walking down the street and we know that there is a shelter under our feet? Should we mark them? Should we mark 1,322 shelters in the city of Barcelona? How to do that? These are questions that I think will be addressed during the panels and tables and the town council, the culture department, the memory department, we will need to make decisions how to open them, in what way, how to show them, how to explain them, how to mark them in the public space. So I would like to thank the organizers. Thank you very much. And next week on the 30th, we encourage you to come to the opening of the exhibition and have a very fruitful couple of days. Thank you very much.